The evolution of snakes, how wrong we are, is always evolving. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Snake bros. <laughs> We're pretty wrong sometimes. Oh, yeah. Most of the time. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent game of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau. We have a, a lot of stuff to talk about today. This is kind of an open-ended show. This is old school style. We're just going to, we don't really know what's going to happen. Those are always good. Yeah. But we have... uh, Pontificating about serpents. (laughs) We have Laura in here uh, right now to give us some updates on the hat boxes. What's going on there? Because there's some strange stuff happening with the shipping, right? Explain explain to us what's going on. Yeah, so... Hello, Snake Force. (laughs) (laughs) I love you and I miss you. Um, We've got international boxes going out tomorrow. I can't take them in sealed up. They take a while to process, so I'm going to do International tomorrow, which I think is about six boxes, and then the rest, which I think is maybe like ten, are going to go to the U.S. uh, on Friday. So I have to basically have the box open, show her every single thing that's in it, weigh it, itemize it, see if it all passed the test. Yeah, some kind of customs thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like we can't, they don't want us to be sending you peaches or something. Yeah, we're not <laughs> sending you peaches, but we're sending you special stuff. And there may be a few items in there that may be borderline not acceptable. And a bullfrog. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Fingers crossed everything gets to go. Um, if something gets the boot, I guess, I don't know what we're going to do. Take a picture of it. I don't think it's going to happen. It's, yeah. I don't think it's, it's happen. probably going to work out. It'll be fine. Um, there would only be one thing in there getting the boot if it got the boot. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> It'll be fine. Sorry. I've had to learn since I've been in this family not to spoil surprises because I'm such a surprise for you. Lithified, <laughs> lithified flora and fauna don't count. Yeah. Um, you so just can't tell the game it away. What's going so, on? yeah, that's what's happening tomorrow. International boxes. And they take a while, so that's going to be a process. And then Friday, the U.S. boxes will go, and, and then we'll be done. It'll Are they be being shipped, like... USPS with a tracking number. Okay. USP- I said that in the snake pit today. USPS goes all the way to, like, Australia? Oh, I'm sorry. The international ones, you're right. I'm not sure what that's going to actually entail. Okay. Yet. But all the other ones are just USPS. It's with- UNPS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> This will actually be my first time shipping internationally, so I'm excited, really, to see what this is all about. You're, you're always excited. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> except when I'm mad, which doesn't happen that much this anymore, is, but still. <laughs> sort of an excitement. <laughs> but I'm having a blast doing it. I, I really am. And then we had the first... You said wild. Yeah, first hat box sighting in the wild today. Oh, I love that <laughs> statement. And I got to see it on the snake pit thread. and Yeah, in the Discord. I'm so, I'm so happy. It's like a bunch of my little babies are finally being see? hatched all over the world. <laughs> and now you can't, you can't get mad at History Shift if he's like freaking out because we haven't got his package yet. <laughs> Which we have one right here. Oh. We'll but before it. you do it. Let me have it. <laughs> um, I would like to say a couple things while I'm in here. I've been listening to some episodes. I'm st- kind of behind. I've had a lot of work going on. But I just wanted to say the Bob Johnson episode and the David Getson episode. Yeah. Stellar. I mean, holy shit. <laughs> I feel like those two guests, I was telling Kyle this earlier, those two guests, in my opinion, have been some of the top perfect examples, perfect guests to come on. Yeah. Yeah. To match what this podcast is all about. Yeah, the David one was really good because, I mean, I was worried at first because it was kind of like in the middle of an enormous day-long conversation drinking. Oh, yeah, and yeah. drinking session we were having. But yes, like we, it, it still worked out good. But yeah, David and Kyle and I had been diving deep into those topics all since he got here. Mm-hmm. And then when we sat down to finally record the show at midnight, you know, by that point we were... I don't know, eight hours into the conversation. Yeah. We're like, let's just start recording it. And it, but it still came out good. Well, 
You, honestly, you couldn't even really tell that you were drunk if you were. It sounded fine. I thought <laughs> I thought you totally passed the test. Portals, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't that bad. I, like, I just couldn't even tell, really. It was, it was fine. But, you know, I spent that time hanging with the girl, Dana, mm-hmm. who I loved. She was also awesome. Yeah. I totally loved Dana. Dana, if you're listening, I love you. I had a great <laughs> time with you. We had a lot of things in common. I mean, it was just a great visit. So And so I didn't really get to visit with David. So then after they're already gone and I'm listening to the episode, I'm like, holy cow, David Getson. Like, whoa, he <laughs> yeah. was at my house and he knows some stuff. Yep. And then Bob Johnson, who we all know and love. Um, I just got done with that episode today. So. Yeah. Yeah. Johnson's great. And of course, we had to have Johnson on the show. Mm-hmm. It's a Johnson. Yeah. So how can you have a I mean, it's just a perfect combination of pyramids, arrowheads and, <laughs> and, and freaking Johnson and geology. I, I mean, know, it's just right? like, holy it was crap. So good. So good. <laughs> it's amazing. I love so many things he said, both of them. So I just wanted to say that, let everybody know that. And we love all of you other guests out there. Oh, yeah. You guys Wait, have Ramazina, all been really come awesome. Come on, you're amazing. So we're, we're, Laura, Laura can pick favorites. That's not our, that's not our thing. It's not your fault. It's just the <laughs> most recent show she's listening to. I'm just, well, all I'm trying to say is I think that they were just such a good fit and I, and I really liked them. So I'm, well, I wasn't Are we saying opening favorite this? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, thank I, well, you, I thought you were trying to hand it to me. I was just. So, yeah, we got. <laughs> resting. Don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> Okay, I'll read this. You get it open. Well, it's already open. Okay, it says, Snakes! Hey, guys, just Mm -hmm. realized that I sent pyramids straight to snakes but forgot to send you crystals to power them. LOL. Oh, wow. (laughs) So here are some Montana crystals. They're Uh, beautiful. Self something. That's beautiful. Look at that. Oh, I was supposed to read this. Oh, self dug. Okay. Self dug by my family and me also included a chunk of what we are mining in. Give one to soul for me. Snakes! Oh, okay. Brandon History Shift. Awesome, buddy. Thank you. And History Shift, I used the box cutter wow. you sent last time on this package, and wow, what a great tool. <laughs> it made the job so easy. <laughs> I really appreciate having that now. These are beautiful. And you did you did send us one big, massive piece of smoky quartz that I think you also said self dug. So yeah, it's sitting here right. on the, uh, yeah, the tangent in- cube uh, magnetic uh, floating bench. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, and buddy. Invention of my very own. Um, back to the hats, real quick, before I run out of here. Um, we have had our first listener <laughs> ask how they can just purchase an individual hat from that same company since they've been shipped. Yeah. So that's pretty special. <laughs> How can will, they do it? Will they do that? Well, you know, I'm still working on the third party vendor, getting it set up to where we've got the button to push on the website. You know, I'm hoping by the fall I have all those kinks worked out because right now I have two companies kind of in the running that I'm trying to sort okay, through yeah, and, yeah. and figure out. Um, but they aren't going to be from the same people that did the these. That they are one of. I'm trying to see if I can work through with them. I'm trying to see if I can get that done. Oh, okay. And I don't know if I can. Yeah. We're working through that. So I just want to say that if somebody just doesn't mind how much it costs because <laughs> it's kind of pricey, I think it's $25 or more if you just order one hat at a time from this company. For just for the hat only. Yeah. You know, so I feel like, I don't know. And then Laura would have to pick it up and <clears throat> ship it to you. No, you would. You could just call them and say, "Hey," because they've got the setup there. Oh, okay. So technically, so then what you, would happen there is it's not supporting the podcast at all. That's what I'm trying to work through with right. them. Is like, hey, you know, we just ordered all these things. So I'm, I'm trying to. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but I just want to say that. Yeah, she bored me with like minutes and minutes of stuff about paper. I was like, Laura, you don't have to say all that stuff. Just <laughs> well, I said maybe I shouldn't say all the stuff. <laughs> but uh, I guess what I'm trying to all I'm trying to leave us with here is um, I'm working on that. I really am working hard on that. But I have had my first person say, I don't care how much it costs. Who do I call? Yeah. We I'm need to find somebody who will make hats and beanies. I think Brothers of the Serpent, like, beanies would be cool. You know, for yeah. people well, who this live in Well, this place could. It's, it's the working out the logistics with the payment and the shipping. And, the, you know, that's what I yeah, have to yeah, get through right. with all these people. So. 
anyway, it was just fun for me because I, you know, I go through all this work for the 33 boxes and pour all my love into them. And then I got somebody I was like, how can I get one? I missed out on the whole deal, but I don't care how much it costs. Tell me what to do. And I was like, okay, buddy. Wow. You're committed. Next time, be there on time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was Archer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> GMA. <laughs> He's like, I don't care what it costs. I won't. Well, he lives here. He I know. He lives up. here. That's yeah. right. So it's a little different. But anyway. So anyway, if you have missed out on hats, don't worry. You're yeah. going to get a hat in the future. Yeah. Rest assured. We'll Hats figure are. it out. Yeah, we yeah. will. Yeah. All right. Okay. Peace. I'm leaving. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. She's out the door. Gone. <laughs> Thanks for the hat update <laughs> and unnecessary information about packing paper. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go ahead and do uh, Space Weather News. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's already got one, you see? <laughs> From spaceweather.com. Comet Neowise just keeps getting better. It is the best comet in years, possibly decades. Comet Neowise is amazing observers as it climbs higher in the evening sky, positioning itself as an easy target for casual stargazers. Uh, and recent photos of the comet with auroras are especially marvelous. Yeah, so I actually got to see it last night, briefly. You lucky dog. Uh, I brought some binoculars so we can check it out tonight. Some. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So at some point in the podcast, Kyle and I are going to pause everything and run outside and see if we can see the thing. Look maybe, at a giant serpent in the sky. Maybe in one of the breaks. Now that I know where to look for it. But yeah, I, I saw it. Uh, the snake stash and I saw it on the horizon. The Big Dipper kind of points at it. So you can use the D Big Dipper uh, as a pointer and down below in the direction that the Dipper is facing, basically. Down below that towards the horizon, you can see the comet. And the it's pretty long. Yeah, here in Texas. Yeah. Well, I think the Big Dipper will be pointing at it no matter where you are. Think so? I think so, because... Well, yeah, I guess it's... I mean, those are background stars. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you are right, sir. I thought of that, too. I was like, maybe it'll be in a different... No, it can't be in a different spot of the sky. <laughs> Unless you're on Jupiter. <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, the maybe. Big Dipper is probably not pointing at it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? We were, we were with... Uh, some of, some of the parents' friends up on the deck a couple of nights ago, and <laughs> she's like, is it going to go by fast? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, a uh, solar cycle update from Space Weather. Uh, NOAA has released a new interactive tool to explore the solar cycle. It lets you scroll back through time. Comparing sunspot counts now to peaks and valleys of the past. One thing is clear, solar, solar minimum is here and it is one of the deepest in a century. Solar minimum is a natural part of the solar cycle. Every 11 years approximately, the sun transitions from high to low activity and back again. Solar maximum, solar minimum, repeat. The cycle was discovered in 1843 by Samuel Heinrich Schwab, or Schwabe, who noticed the pattern after counting sunspots for 17 years. We are now exiting solar cycle 24 and entering solar cycle 25. During solar minimum, the sun is usually blank, that is, without sunspots. The solar disk often looks like a big orange billiard ball. In 2019, the sun went 281 days without sunspots, and 2020 is producing spotless suns at about the same rate. To find a year with fewer sunspots, you have to go all the way back to 1913, mm. which had 311 spotless days. Hmm. Hmm. This makes 2019-2020 a century-class solar minimum. Solar flares are rare, geomagnetic storms are almost non-existent, and Earth's upper atmosphere is cooling. Some people worry that the sun could get stuck in solar minimum, uh, solar minimum producing a mini ice age caused by low solar activity. There is no evidence that this is happening. On the contrary, the next solar cycle, 25, is showing unmistakable signs of life. On May 29th, the sun unleashed the strongest solar flare in years, an M1-class eruption that just barely missed Earth. The blast came from an active region belonging to Solar Cycle 25. Observers are also seeing a growing number of Solar Cycle 25 sunspots. So far in 2020, the sun has produced a dozen of them. Nine of them have the magnetic polarity of Solar Cycle 25. This compares to only 17% in 2019 and zero in 2018. The sun is clearly tipping from one solar cycle to the next. 
An NOAA-led panel of experts actually predicted this behavior. Last year, they said that solar minimum would hit rock bottom sometime in late 2019, early 2020, and activity would then quicken in 2021 and 22, ramping up to a new solar maximum in 2023 to 26. So far, so good. Uh, I don't know if this has any correlation, but probably not. But uh, the the great fireball procession of 1913. Oh, yeah, that's right. Is that what it's called? Yes. Yeah. Pro procession. Procession. <clears throat> it did happen in 1913. That uh, is interesting. Yeah. Major solar minimum. Mm. Just saying, maybe. <laughs> 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 this time we have a comet. <laughs> All right, current conditions. Solar wind speed is 423.9 kilometers per second. Density is 3.3 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, as we said, spotless state. We have current sunspot number is zero. Spotless days for this year is 147 or 75%. And let's see what the, what the neutron counts are. Today is 9. Really bad. 9.1% <laughs> 9 plus or above the uh, average space age neutron count. <clears throat> so it's rated as high. Uh, but the maximum ever read was 11.7 plus. Hmm. Minimum was 32.1 below. So we're, we're in a high, high neutron count. Watch out. Yep. But yeah, just going back to this weird idea that, uh, you know, the solar wind, you know, okay, when they talk about ways we could protect ourselves from uh, asteroids or something that might be potentially impacting Earth, we could go out there and, like, paint one surface of it. <laughs> yeah. To, to make give it a higher albedo, and that would, over time, sh shift its orbit. Right. So, in a high, like, imagine over time these solar maximums and solar minimums how they're pushing and not pushing yeah on these objects that are you know it's always slightly changing their orbits based on how active the sun is or not yeah yeah how much solar flux there is basically yeah yeah, yeah. that's true and then if the 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 less solar flux there is the more interstellar stuff is getting through the helio sheath and pushing mm -hmm. on them in that way too but that's probably like almost that's probably a tiny tiny amount i don't know but i know that the you know the the the, the sun has a shield around the entire right, solar yeah. system uh, and it's that shield the helio sheath or the what what else what does it call the heliopause i think is the other term for it is the place where the outgoing solar wind is actually equal in energy to the incoming, incoming. stellar wind. Yeah, so that's yeah, pretty yeah. strong, you know, that's that's a lot of of juice mm. coming yeah. at us from the rest of the galaxy and, and the yeah. rest of the universe. So, so I'm, I'm not trying to say that a minimum has a significant effect any more so than a maximum would, right? They would both cause minor yeah. perturbations or whatever in, in these objects that are flying around, these small objects mainly. Yeah. I mean, you can see the strength of the solar wind right now by looking at the comet. That tail yeah, that's true, yeah. is, is being pushed. It's That tail is always facing out away from the center of the sun. Yeah. Because, the, the you know, and I was talking to, to the snake stash about this last night. He's like, it's weird that it's not like just behind it on its trail. And I'm like, I know. Yeah. When you w look at the images of when a comet is going around the sun, the tail is always facing exactly yeah. away from the center of the sun. It has nothing to do with the direction of the comet's travel. Yeah. And everything to do with the direction of the outflow of energy from the sun itself. So that's pretty strong. Yeah. It's cool. It's getting fried. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a lot. I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes you see estimates <clears throat> and they'll say millions of tons of gas and volatiles and ice and everything are being blown off that comet and then pushed towards the outside of the solar system. Yep. Millions of tons of stuff. So that's pretty serious force. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> We're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get to space. Yeah. <clears throat>
living next to a giant star is is dangerous. <laughs> yeah. You never know when the thing could explode more than it already is. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, that's the nature, that's the nature of life. Like we have to build fires and then we need to get close to them, but not yeah, too close. Yeah, not too close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and don't let it get too big. <laughs> <laughs> Water's like that too. You got to have it to live, but too much of it. Really bad. Really bad. Yeah. Really bad stuff happens. <laughs> Same thing with beer. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have some, <laughs> but you don't want too much. I'm, I'm not sure that's the same thing. <laughs> it's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, listener communication. Yeah. Listener communications. Real quick. Let me go first. Oh, okay. Uh, I've got a couple of donation comments. First one from, <laughs> I don't know who this is, but Acme Records. <laughs> <laughs> I have been listening to podcasts for almost 20 years. Episode 84 with your dad talking about engineering was one of the best of all. Wow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Or ma'am. Not sure who Acme Records is, but that's cool. <laughs> I have a band, by the way, Acme Records. <laughs> <laughs> uh, based on their track record with the with the <laughs> with the coyote, I'm not sure you want to sign up with Acme Records. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this one is um, from anonymous. Please keep my identity secret. <laughs> Bounty paid for location of Michigan Wall. Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, this is a new thing that's happening in the Discord. <laughs> If you really want to figure something out and you can't do it yourself or you're too lazy, you can offer a bounty in the Discord and let other people do all the work and then pay us money. It totally works out. <laughs> when, it, when you get the, the results yeah, you want. Yeah, when you get what you want from other people who aren't us, you pay us. <laughs> I think this is a fantastic deal it's, and people should keep doing it. This is a brilliant <laughs> pyramid scheme. <laughs> all right. So yeah. wait a minute. I want to tell, I want to kind of say what that is because it's really cool. Okay. All they had, all they had when we started with this mystery was uh, a very old photo of a couple of, and it's black and white, very old, right? Of a couple of people standing in what kind of looked like the, the woods and out of the, the foliage was coming what looks like a, a constructed ancient wall of megalithic blocks. Oh, wow. And they were like, can anybody find out where this is? You know, just posting the photo. And people were able to track it back to an old book through the Gu Gutenberg Project, which which the Gutenberg Project is a place that puts scanned images of a bunch of old books. So it was a photo book of what was it was called the it was called uh, Michigan's Copper Country. So it was a uh, book about from like 1912 or something that was published. But sure way it was 1913. It might have been 1913. Published way back then about Copper Country and all the copper mines in the Michigan area. Where mm -hmm. all the ancient mines were. Yes. Right? And on the photo, it said, Profile Rock, C-R-R-R. -R -R. Right? Mm. And so I was like, I'm looking everywhere for Profile Rock. And of course, there's a whole bunch of rocks called Profile Rock all over the place that they kind of look like a face if you're looking at it from the side. Yeah. And I wasn't finding anything of this picture, but somebody pointed out, hey, C-R-R-R -R -R stands for uh, Copper Range Railroad. Ah. So we're like, okay, so maybe it's near the tracks. In the mid, in the copper country, so, but at this point we figured out okay if it's from if it's from that book it must be in Michigan, right? So now we have now we're narrowing it down to some railroad tracks that used <laughs> to go through the copper mine area, <laughs> and then eventually somebody found an actual modern photograph of it and figured out exactly where it was. So that's awesome. Bounty paid <laughs> yes. to us, even though we didn't do any work. <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right, and this one's from Jason. Thanks. For blowing my mind. <laughs> you guys rock. <laughs> You're welcome, buddy. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Bounty paid. <laughs> All right. This next one. You guys ruined my life. <laughs> Please take my money and give me back my small brain. <laughs> the brain expansion is too much even for my long head. Uh, I mean, normal head. <laughs> Sincerely, 
Great lad. He's <laughs> <laughs> great lad in the Discord. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. It's ruined my life. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much yeah thanks to everyone who uh who donates to the pyramid scheme we really appreciate it yeah it's amazing yeah and and we love the donation comments yeah so all right this is an email from michael it's called smarter every day (laughs) question mark Says, just had my first cup of Joe out of my new Brothers of the Serpent coffee mug. Yes. Will using it make me smarter every day? (laughs) (laughs) But you all and Randall and Brad and Normal Guy Mike sure have. I know you hear it a lot, but sincere thanks for all the hard work you put in to push back against the forces that would prefer we remain blind to whatever our true past really is. I want to tell you the best thing I heard you guys say was don't look for answers, look for better questions. That is a truly an insightful way to go about all aspects of life. Respectfully yours, Mike and Snacks. <laughs> awesome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And he's got a, he sent us a picture, which I've for the purposes of anonymity, I can't post, but he shows a picture of him with his coffee mug. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. That's Heck really yeah. cool. Yep, I agree. That's uh, looking for better questions is a great way to oh look, great way to explore. He also joined the Patreon because here's a Patreon message from him too. He says, "Just joined as a lunar member, which is fitting, being a bit of a loon. <laughs> you guys are worth every penny." Onto the pyramids, and I hope when you're there, the fact that they won't let you see the things that we all know are being hidden from ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the world won't take too much away from the joy of standing in front of it and shouting, "What the heck are you really? Peace and snakes." <laughs> <laughs> wow bought a coffee mug join the join the patreon man yeah, thank buddy. you yeah uh okay let's see what we got here oh this is from kevin but flapperton in, the, up, in the discord he says snake bros and the snake force at large so this is this is an email to from him to the snake force basically he says Since discovering the podcast earlier this year, I have slowly grown to become a part of an unseen entity, the Snake Force, the reach of which seems to grow broader every day. At first, just a casual listener, then devouring the entire catalog of back episodes and finally joining the Discord. Being my first endeavor into social media, I was skeptical and not expecting much. As usual... I was wrong. The conversations are amazing. The people are open-minded and the topics are as widely varied as the show. I encourage anyone listening to join and open yourself up to the possibility of discovery. I am gearing up for the trip to the Scablands and will be picking up a snake or two along the way. History Shift and I will be rolling into Soap Lake in style. Thanks for everything you do, Snake Force. I love you all, but Flapperton. (laughs) We love you, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. How's how's always well? (laughs) But that's the cool dude riding with history shifts. Yeah, and I also agree. Like, uh, you know, I've seen some people mention that uh, they're kind of worried about joining the Discord. God, you guys got to try it. It really is amazing in there. Um, there are a couple of people that joined. Their li- they were like, I was worried that I was too dumb for the Discord. No, dude, we're all dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is all- only our combined Don't force worry. that makes us less dumb. <laughs> I'm the dumbest one in the Discord. <laughs> so it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is from uh, this is from Joe, and this was a this is actually a meetup report. First, the very first ever Snake Bros Snake Force meetup. No way. Yeah. So that's another thing we have. Well, in the I don't know if you could call it that. Why not? Because there were two Snake Force guys that met up in a bar by accident. That's and they true. didn't know each other. That's true. Well, that, that's not an actual, like, <laughs> planned okay, Snake Force planned. meetup. One of them was wearing a bro's a spontaneous shirt. spontaneous meetup. Yeah. He was like, that's Snake Bros. <laughs> you wore a t-shirt. <laughs> <clears throat> so this one was up. Okay, planned. Fine. Planned meetup. Uh, so he met with uh, Brandon mm-hmm. to go hiking to look at, you know, all the Dolman stuff that Brandon's looking for. So he says, this is from Joe. He says, snakes, I originally hoped to send you a postcard of beautiful Boulder, Montana, but I guess the postcard industry isn't really a thing anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Great idea. A couple of decades too late. (laughs) Anyways, I wanted to thank History Shift for showing me around the Boulder Batholith and checking out some dolmens. 
I checked out his stuff online and I thought he was a, a little crazy. And then the first few rocks we saw were just, you know, seemingly natural phenomena. Then we crossed the creek and things got weird. Located between a confluence of cold mountain streams, there was what I call, would call a fortress full of head-scratching standing stones, dolmens, and what looked like Egyptian statues. Who knows what the truth really is, but I hope History Shift keeps exploring and having a good time. To all the snakes out there, I hope you can get out into the field and check out your local parks and museums with new friends and expand your mind. Thank you, Russ and Kyle, for having these great conversations that keep me learning. Joe. And, the, and then he has a PS. Snakes. <laughs> A very calm snakes, not a loud one. You never know who's listening out here in the woods. <laughs> snakes. Snakes. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <clears throat> yeah, we also have been talking about the fact that we need to do this more. Like we've been, I've been really busy, so we haven't, haven't uh, done any field trips and we've been planning on going on these these big trips, contact the cabin stuff, and they've been postponed. And so we're like, uh, well, we need to go take some local local field trips. Yeah. Get out and look at some more stuff again with yeah. these eyes. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll be doing that soon. Yep. So, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> we need to get out there and do it. Even us. We haven't <laughs> been doing it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we take a break and we'll come back with some more. I got yep. uh, some more. Snacks! Driving the Inlils of the World Mad by reason of our babble here at uh, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And yeah, we're back. We are. We got more listener communications and we do. What else? What a, else you got? A few more of those and then uh, are, are we going to do stories uh, or are we going to tackle this really long email at the end there? It's up to you. I don't have any stories. They're your stories. Oh. You, you, you go for it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this one's called uh, Not Missing 411, Breaking Radio Silence. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, Snake Force Commanders. Captain Boz of the Uinta Snake Force here. Breaking Radio Silence to report on a potential missing 411 of yours truly. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, almost glad. While I am currently deep undercover on an expedition to cover, uncover the truth about Skinwalker Ranch, the missing skull from the White Rocks Cave, and the discovery of Clovis Points at the 8,000-foot elevation near Alpine Lakes, well, during this time I have caught up on my snake studies digesting all of the bots' podcasts. Your sows on the missing 411 have enhanced these eyes. Now, this story took place in 2012 on my first adventure deep into the Uinta Mountains near uh, Chapeta, or I don't know how to say it, Chapeta Lake. Chapata? Chipet, it's C H E P E T A. Okay. Chapeta. Chipita? <laughs> yeah. Chipeta? He says, My wife, newborn, and aggressive red healer dog accompanied me on a weekend camping trip, which ended with us sleeping in our truck 100 miles away from where we pitched our tent. I must say that this strange evening was embarrassing and then soon written off and rarely discussed. Learning of the missing 411 brought these chilling memories back. After setting camp next to a stream, we walked out into a nearby meadow, at which point our dog caught the fear and hid between my legs, whimpering. This was followed by odd whistling sounds that were coming from opposite sides of the forest surrounding the meadow. Whoa. We assumed a bear must be nearby, but the whistling truly sounded like it was people communicating back and forth. Reminding me of when I was a Boy Scout playing Capture the Flag in the woods. Back at the truck, gun loaded and ready, my killer dog jumped in the truck not to re-emerge that night. Amongst discussions of whether to stay or leave, a deer would walk to the edge of our camp, stare at us, then up the stream. After the deer com came by several times, my fearful wife, taken over by a trance, walked to the edge of the woods right up to the deer. They stood face to face for several minutes. When my wife walked back to our truck, she said there was danger upstream. And we had to leave. Oh, my gosh. I protested. As I wasn't about to break up camp at 9 p.m., 
with the ultimatum that her and our son would sleep in the truck that one, and the one that my protector dog would not leave and I would sleep alone in the tent, well, that's when fear overtook me and we packed up. As we pulled out of the campsite, our headlights lit up a smiley face painted in reflective paint on a tree. We freaked and sped off the mountain. Mm. While the smiley face is likely unrelated, it was odd we had not seen it all evening. These eyes now help me to understand the odd whistling, the dog that would not track, the stream and nearby boulder fields, the odd trance and communication with the deer. I am happy to report I am not a missing 411. Oh, man. Back to the expedition at ham. God. Skirped hards beware. Yours truly, Captain Baz of the Uinta Snake Force Basin. Holy crap. That's chilling. That is a freaky story right there, bud. <laughs> Almost glad. Glad you didn't glad. <laughs> Man, I would love to hear any more stories like that if people have them. Write in. Let us know. Because, yeah, that's the whistling, man. That really. Mm, I don't know. Standing face to face with the deer and coming back and saying there's danger upstream is like, <laughs> oof, chills. That's pretty creepy, Holy too. crap. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Uh, Got to trust the wife's intuition there, buddy. That's Just right. get out. <laughs> that's right. Okay, this is a, a comment left on the website from BV. It says, I am a newbie to the show after hearing it mentioned on No Agenda. Love it hey, so hey. far. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. It got me thinking Thank about... Thank you for your courage. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your courage. <laughs> <laughs> ITM, buddy. It got me thinking about things, and now I'm on a mission. Does anyone know of any software like Google Earth that lets you view the Earth throughout history with ocean levels rising I and falling want accordingly? This. <laughs> I want this so bad. No, I don't know about that, but like, maybe the snake force can come through. Like, go back and see what the oceans and coastlines looked like 100,000 years ago. Yes. God. So there, there is... Okay. I'm not 100% positive about this, but I did. I people in this in the Discord do talk about it, uh, and I was seeing some people saying that there are some plugins you can get for Google Earth that that let you raise and lower um, the sea levels. Yeah, but it doesn't work perfectly because and, yeah, because there's no isostatic exactly, and also it's just it's. So yeah, it isn't like something where you can say, "What did it look like a thousand years ago?" It just you can just say, "Lower the sea level to hundred feet." Right. That's still cool. That is. Yeah. But you have to imagine now you you lower those sea levels hundred feet. Where did you put them? Yeah. Right. You put them up in the ice caps, and yeah. then those push down, and then other land pops up, and you know, there's it's so complex. Yeah. It would be it would have to be modeled, and we know how accurate models are. Right. The closest thing I can remember to something like this was when Graham Hancock was writing uh, Underworld, which, BB, if you want to pick that book up if you're interested in this, <clears throat> because he had a geologist who was doing that modeling for him to help him look at coastlines yeah, and what they may have looked like. So, like, Graham would go diving somewhere, find some anomalous something on the, on the seabed in the area where he was diving... And then he would go back to this guy and say, how long ago, according to the models, was this above sea level? And then the dude mm -hmm. would run his models and then give him some data and maps and stuff. So that's the closest thing I know to that. And according to Graham, and that, you know, that book is old now. It's, I think it was written in the 90s. Not totally positive. Maybe it was it Was it after? It was after um, The Sign and the Seal, right? Yeah, it was after Fingerprints wrote... of the Gods. Oh, okay. It's basically the sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. Like he writes Fingerprints of the Gods, and he realizes all the cool stuff that that I'm going to be looking for is going to be underwater. Ah. And then he's and then he starts diving, and then he writes Underworld. Okay, man, we got to go through that one. Yeah, it's a great book to go. We've gone through bits and pieces of yeah, it, like with the Dogon and every, or the Dogu statues and the Japanese stuff. But yes, we need to do need to go through that book. <clears throat> so, man, thanks for the comment. Yeah, and there are some maps that you can find. I mean, but I know what you're talking about. You want. You want a Google Earth deal? Me too. Yeah. Definitely want that. That would be really cool. Yeah. All right. So I've got two communications here from Nick. The first one I'm going to read here is his, it, he signed up for Patreon. Think about it. Yeah. He says, it was time. 
all I do is listen to your podcast these days. <laughs> I already have cold sweats about what I'll do when I've listened to them all. Would love to send more, but my biological robot family will get upset if they don't have their daily fuel. So I hope this small slice of double pie will at least help a little. Keep up the great work. Nick. <laughs> his double pie. His biological robot family. That'll make more sense once I read this actual email. <laughs> Thanks for signing up, buddy. I really appreciate that. Uh, let me find it. Here it is. Okay. So he says... Dear Snake Folk, apologies in advance for the length of this. I come to you from a familiar path like so many others, but with a small twist at the beginning. Mine started with Graham Hancock, which led me to Joe Rogan instead of the reverse. And Randall Carlson, so this is what Santa does for the rest of the year. <laughs> and on to Cosmographia, Cosmographia, and then you. And how glad I am that I found you. I can't imagine my evenings for the last few months without you sat alone, listening in my garage, smoking, occasionally drinking and playing games on my phone while the wife and kids sleep soundly indoors. Heaven. <laughs> 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 After getting and keeping up to date on the recent podcast, I've now gone back to listen to the back catalog. I'm so glued, I've even managed to get myself way behind on the Cosmographia stuff. Something that I'll have to catch up on eventually. It is uncanny how similar our thoughts and ideas are. You are like an oasis of sanity and rationalism in a sea of temples, rituals, and denials. There are a couple of areas where we disagree, and this is only natural. The first is forgivable and rather minor, though I would hope that you would bring your usually excellent and rational thinking to this area as well. Uh, he says... I think it's mostly rust. Sometimes it's hard to tell you two apart, to be honest, but I'm an Englishman living in the Czech Republic, so what am I going to do? But your bent towards believing in some kind of spiritual world is not something I can subscribe to. Rather the opposite, I want and need to see physical realis realistic explanations for the world around us. I can imagine impossible blocks being levitated into position with, with, within the laws of physics, even if we don't know how. I can understand that the Great Pyramids might have been power stations harnessing some as yet not understood science, but ghosts, alternative dimensions of reality, and souls moving from life to life and actual capital G gods, nah mate, not convinced. <clears throat> I think what we have is here and now, and that's it. And we are indeed, to quote one of you, biological robots. <laughs> <laughs> One of you. <laughs> One of the things that has led me to this thought is the phenomena, much like a computer, of data in, data out. I've lost count of the number of times the wife and I have been watching some old family films of when the kids were small and one of them would do something on the screen, prompting one of us to say the exact same thing at exactly the same time in exactly the same way as our on-screen self. Data in, data out. That's not to say we can't act spiritually with kindness and compassion, trying to live more thoughtful or, dare I say, spiritual lives, but there is no more than this. The second point that actually prompted me to write this email is your disbelief in and denial of evolution. You've mentioned it many times, and I try to ignore it because, meh. But then near the episode end of episode 65, in a rant of epic proportions... <laughs> <laughs> discussing Neil deGrasse Tyson, Gravity and Evolution, you said something that I just couldn't let go, and I quote, so here he's quoting me, trying to conflate the completely unproven and unprovable theory of evolution and unobservable phenomena, if it even exists, of evolution with a phenomena that we can see all the time and pretending that it's a theory, that is classic Skirptard, and it is incredibly <laughs> and deeply disingenuous. <laughs> It is like playing on the assumption that people don't know the difference between these things and then trying to trick them into not questioning something that should be questioned because there is zero evidence of it and you can't observe it, unquote. That's weird quoting myself. Yeah, I was going to say. That's <laughs> pretty, pretty weird hearing you quote yourself. <laughs> so Nick says, My head dropped and my heart sank a little on hearing this. It is so unusually and uncharacteristically unthinking and unresearched of you that I am more than surprised. There really is a wealth of information supporting evolution that would only take you 30 minutes of Googling evidence for evolution to have a basic understanding of it and to understand why it's real. I can't imagine that you haven't done this, which only adds to my confusion and surprise. The fact is, evolution is observable, has been observed, and can easily be shown through other means such as the study of morphology and physiology of animals, including us. For example, and to simplify it somewhat, the recurrent Lar uh, laryngeal nerve in mammals travels down the neck, curves under the collarbone, and goes back up to the larynx. It does this in all mammals, including the giraffe, where it is 20 feet long when one would have, when one would have been enough. In fish, the homologous 
don't know how to say this word. Homologous nerve follows a short straight path. This poor design in mammals could only have happened through evolution. Now, it may be that you've been confused, even indoctrinated by your Christian upbringing, which would be completely understandable, with terms such as macro and microevolution. These terms are not really helpful and in my experience are only used by evolution deniers. In the grand scale of things, there is no macro and microevolution. There is only evolution. No one ever claimed a fish gave birth to a lizard. That's not evolution. That's, I don't even know what that would be. But small changes, tiny, minute changes, generation by generation, that might give an advantage or be favored in some way can eventually add up to major changes. Imagine a fish in a shallow pool with slightly larger fins than normal. When a predator comes, maybe he is able to move into the shallows and drag himself up the sandy bank a little uh, better than the rest and so survives and has more babies and the process repeats until after many different kinds of mutations and changes we have a creature more akin to an amphibian than a fish <clears throat> and so it continues gaps in the fossil record of course there are you yourselves have discussed how fossils need some kind of disaster to be made some sudden and rapid burying without oxygen this doesn't happen every day and doesn't mean evolution isn't true <clears throat> Evolution can be very slow, like in the above examples, or rather quick, as in the case of a population of peppered moths in Britain that over the course of a few generations in the 19th century changed from predominantly white to predominantly black due to the presence of soot and dirt from industrialization, allowing the white version to be eaten more by predators. Or the population of mosquitoes in the London underground rail system that are now so different from their above ground cousins that they can no longer interbreed. These may be small examples and neither turned into a new creature altogether, but given enough changes and enough time, they will. Now, <clears throat> all of this doesn't mean I necessarily agree with the standard model timelines of human evolution. In fact, I suspect they're wrong. Nor does it mean that our genome wasn't messed with, altered, added to in the past. I think there's fair amount of evidence to suggest that it was. But before then, we, or at least the creatures we were created from, evolved on this world alongside all the others. I urge you to look more into it or even get an evolutionary biologist as a guest. That would be fun for your own betterment. When you say things like in episode 65 above, it makes you sound crazy where everything else you do is so on point. Maybe you have. Maybe it's one of my still unlistened podcasts and you've already moved on. If so, great. If not, do it. Anyway, I better stop here as this is already rather long. I think it's traditional and expected that around here I yell snakes and move on. <laughs> I absolutely love your shows. Keep up the great work and keep them coming. Much love, your biological robot, Nick. P.S. The music is awesome. P.P.S. Please stop saying quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> First thing I want to say is that was the most like enormously massive compliment sandwich I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> compliment sandwiches are great <laughs> you're doing great work here's where you're totally wrong but keep it up man you're doing awesome <laughs> that's a good way to do it yeah well thank you buddy um man that's a lot to reply to yeah <sighs> where to start oh. um well let's start with that quote yeah, we can we can discuss the quote. I, I think that he probably knows this, but that quote that you quoted me from was actually I wasn't actually talking specifically about evolution. I was talking about the disingenuousness of comparing the theory of evolution to the phenomena of gravity. That's what I was complaining about on that. And everything that I said in that quote is true. When you're talking about the phenomena of gravity versus the idea of evolution. Right. And we, I don't think that we also, I would say that we are not evolution deniers, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, not, not at all. Not at all. <clears throat> I think that what you said at the end there, uh, when you were talking specifically about the evolution of hum modern humans is how I look at the entirety of it. In other words, that evolution is a process that has clearly happened, but whatever the mechanisms are, I don't think are fully understood. Yeah. There is one, one part of the quote uh, where you said there's zero evidence for it or something like that. But I mean, I would just point out that 
if you record yourself for two hours every week, you're going to say some shit that's wrong. And we have, <laughs> we have admitted that from day one. That's right. right. We say yeah. wrong stuff. That's one of the reasons why we got the watcher, which we don't have right now. Watcher's not here. But, um, yeah, it's uh, that quote is definitely about the false equivalence of a completely and totally observable law, basically, of physics to a theory which is not ob observable. Like you pointed out, you can see tiny changes and then you can extrapolate because you see a tiny change over generations that maybe that tiny change results in speciation, right? One species becoming another species, but that doesn't, that's not observable. Right, by because nature. Because it's too long yeah. for us to actually observe it. We don't observe it every day. If it's true, we observe only the results. Right. Right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's true. We, we're looking at something and we're trying to figure out how it could have come about. Like this is, this happens in physics all the time. We observe gravity and we're trying to figure out how does this come about? That's where the theory comes into play, but we don't have a theory right now for gravity because nobody's really come up with something that works right? or that seems to work. And even if it does seem to work, that would require testing and testing and testing. Yeah. In order to, you know, it's, it, we, we say this a lot too, is that it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to prove something, to prove a theory, you know, uh, it's, it's easier to falsify it. Yeah. And the, and the, the longer it goes without being falsified, the stronger the theory becomes, but it's never proven totally. That doesn't mean it isn't true though. It just means that's just a principle in this, in the sense that you can't, ever prove something 100% true. You can have observ obs you know, observed information, <clears throat> like how you pointed out that we see these small changes, like you pointed out with the moth, right? And that is an interesting thing, but that isn't necessarily even, I mean, that, that color change could have, uh, could have been in their DNA already. You know, it isn't, it, that, that in, its, in and of itself isn't necessarily a process that is involved in evolution. We talked about this quite a bit, you know, and, and uh, I think that the, <laughs> the, the other process you, you talked about, which is the, you know, the, the, the fish thing in the tide pool that eventually keeps like coming out of the water and that allows it to get away from predators and then it's allowed to breed. And that eventually may result in something more like an amphibian. Well, that is a process. That's the kind of process I'm talking about that has never been observed. Yes, you can sit here and tell that story. And you tell that story based on other things that have been observed, like the minute change of color in the scales on a moth's wings. But that doesn't... Those two things aren't necessarily connected. We do think that they might be connected. And so that's the difference. So the quote where I was like flipping out about Neil deGrasse Tyson comparing the theory of evolution to the theory of gravity, you know, and I think another part of that quote is he was like, you know, you can jump out the window if you want to question the theory of gravity. And that's incredibly disingenuous. There yeah. is no, you know, the, jumping out the window to test gravity, number one, is not something anybody would have to do because we all know it exists because all you have to do is let go of something. The yeah. other thing is that there is no theory of gravity. That's really what I was flipping out about in that comment. You know, it wasn't necessarily about evolution. I actually wasn't really talking about evolution. I was freaking out because uh, here this guy is an astrophysicist or whatever, and he's talking about a theory of gravity which doesn't actually exist. Right? So, yeah, I guess if you're right in the quota there, if I said there's zero evidence for it, well, that okay, there's there's not zero evidence. And actually, the idea of of, of evolution itself... Kyle and I were talking about this a couple of days ago, and we were. Kyle pointed out, like, look, the the idea of evolution is one of the best explanations we have for all the life that we see on Earth. Yeah, I think that is actually how we think about it. It doesn't mean it's true, but what what's happening is, is we're looking at all the life that exists, and we're saying, well, how can we explain this? Yeah, especially in a mechanistic way. Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, if you look at what the 
theory of evolution says as far as like the timelines that, that it takes for these things to happen. And we're looking at, you know, uh, geology alongside with that and the catastrophic change that has taken place multiple times very frequently on the planet, as the evidence suggests, it makes this theory as it stands in the standard model right now seem very implausible. Yeah. So the the as the, the part of it that I really like, like after we did the the Wickramasinghe um, interview, is that really blew my mind because it expands the, the playing mechanism, field. the playing <laughs> field of evolution to the cosmos, and that's really where I'm like, okay, this seems like it's much more plausible to me now when you can when you can introduce all of this other stuff out there that we, you know, obviously we can't um, go to these other planets, these exoplanets, and see what's going on there. We don't have that proof yet, but maybe someday. But the work that, that Wick Ramasinghe did and is still working on with that idea, sort of the panspermia idea, is like, to me, uh, I really like that direction in terms of evolution. And we've, you know, we've talked about how viruses edit DNA and do weird stuff like that. That that type of a mechanism seems more likely to me than just, you know, a fish getting up on shore and flapping its fins and laying eggs. And, oh, because I could flap my fins on the shore, then maybe my babies will flap their fins on the shore. And <laughs> just, I mean, it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the ones that can't flap their fins on the shore die out. I, I know the story. We've all heard the story. Yeah. Right. It just it seems like it there needs to be more to it than just that. Right. And then when you look at these impact sites that have strange situ things going on with life forms nearby and in them, like the Carolina Bays, we you know, of course, it's not proven that those are impact sites admitting that. You know, they're the freaking lacustrine boring <laughs> wind blowing something or others. <laughs> Yeah, the Aeolian, the Artesian, <laughs> Lacustrine, Caucasian something. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Tung Tunguska site, the, the weird stuff that happened there uh, after that uh, event with with the, the wildlife around the area. So that is a really cool proposition to me. Um but again, yeah, it is a theory. And the way you talk about it is like, I can't believe you guys don't totally believe this theory. Well, welcome to the Brothers of the Serpent podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> and right. Another, another thing you said, too, was you said, uh, I need to see things in this certain way, right? I don't. The way I, I am, I don't need to see it that way. I love to try to cram whatever weird phenomena we're discussing into my, un, my rudimentary understanding of physics and try to figure out how it could work with physics. I mean, that's, I love doing that. But I don't need it to be the explanation. Yeah. Right? If, if there is no explanation that works with every, anything that I could understand about physics, that doesn't really bother me. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, one of the main premises of this podcast is that we we ask a lot of questions. And, you know, we we're, we I think that we mostly uh, on a lot of the subjects we talk about, we we try our best to study the standard accepted models of whatever the topic is. Um, you know, obviously we don't we're not experts in any of these standard model things, whether it's evolution or physics or particle physics or, you know, ancient like the archaeological stuff. We we we're we're laymen on all this stuff. But the purpose of the podcast is for us to kind of talk through these things. And I would still stand by most of my quote there, uh, especially because I think that you were you were kind of taking it out of context. Uh, and what I was really mad about was actually the idea that there's a theory of gravity and there's not. That's really what I was pissed <laughs> off about. And you're like, holy crap, this guy doesn't believe in evolution. And that isn't true. <laughs> I think that evolution is just not fully explained, but evolution definitely happens. I would say it like that. And I don't need 
uh, a spiritual explanation for evolution, although I am interested in looking at those kinds of, you know, like, 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 like panpsychism or animism. The idea that consciousness is in and of itself is somehow fundamental to the universe, and it may a pay a play a part in the evolution of species and animals and life in general yeah. on our world and throughout the cosmos. I think that's a that's to me that's a really interesting way to look at it. Uh, I don't know what that means specifically. Like in other words, how, what does it mean that consciousness is fundamental? Where does it come from? I have no idea. But I think that that idea does would help to fill some holes, just like Wickrama Singh's idea of more of a cosmic environment for evolution to take place in the first place also helps fill some problems in the evolutionary ideas. And, you know, we see these things like you have this enormous extinction level event, and then right afterwards, it seems like with the limited data that we have, because the data is limited, that there's like an explosion of new kinds of life. And so that's like a sort of punctuated equilibrium sort of thing. That there's an ex there's an extinction level event, a, ju a huge catastrophe. Then there's an enormous amount of evolution that takes place in a seemingly very small amount of time. And then after that, everything gets stable for a yes. long period of time. That is not a gradualistic neo-Darwinism explanation of evolution. Yeah, so this is a good point. When we trash the theory of evolution, it doesn't mean we believe in a great consciousness just created everything as it was. Right. We're like, we're, we're pointing out problems with the theory, which I always, I always say it's easy to point out problems. It's hard to come up with a new theory that fits all of the data. That's better. Right. So I admit that, but we do point out like, okay, it didn't happen necessarily the way the theory is trying to lay it out using it. And, and we went through this in some book recently, uh, I think it was the uh, Velikovsky book. Yeah, where Darwin and his buddy, uh, you know this. Oh, the lawyer. Yeah, the lawyer guy <laughs> are working on the uh, uniformitarian idea. Yeah, alongside the evolution theory, right? So they need everything on the Earth to be really stable and slow, and you know, gradualistic change in order for this theory to work. Well. We we look at catastrophism, and so it's like okay, there's problems, right? Yeah. So that it's 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 a more of a, I think what you're probably detecting is a frustration on the part of, you know, the 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 models of geology and evolution being so stuck in that paradigm, and not shifting, not, you know, what I'm saying, not yeah. wanting to. Uh, change their ideas or, or, you know, even broaden it to a, a cosmic scale. Right. In either one, right? Geology does, the, the standard model of geology resists the cosmic influences playing a part. Right. It wants to, it, g standard geology wants to be isolationist in yeah. terms of the earth. Yeah. Yep. But in the end, I would say the two things to remember. One is that we're like 97.8% wrong about everything we say on the show. We talk about this all the time, right? So just keep that in mind. And the other thing to keep in mind when you totally disagree with, with us on stuff is that's probably the 2.2% of stuff that we're totally right about. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful there. <laughs> all right, let's take a break. pyramids tied behind our backs just to make it square brothers of the serpent podcast here being totally wrong about almost everything almost all of the time we're still thinking and talking about evolution but in the meantime we took a quite of a long a quite a long break there that was about an hour break to go look at the comet that's right and uh i busted out some binoculars and we went out in the dark and we were actually able to see it for a couple of minutes uh, before it went 
behind something. something. <laughs> <laughs> just ban- <laughs> We didn't look at it for a little while, and then we were like, oh, let's look at it again, and nope. Nope. Couldn't see gone. it. But it was cool. It was the first time I got to see it. So. Yeah, very cool. Need bigger binoculars next time. <laughs> Yeah, I might have to. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of waiting for it to climb higher in the sky. I think by the 19th, it's going to be up far enough above the horizon where uh, it'll be in the clear. away from the haze. Yeah, away yeah. from the, the the horizon haze. And we are joined by the watcher. Oh yeah, uh, from deep beneath his space station in secret outer space. Watcher, how's it going, buddy? It goes. Sorry, I had to readjust my uh, sound filter. <laughs> yes, you must wear a mask even in space because that's where the yeah, viruses that's... are coming from, folks. <laughs> it's called evolution. It... I cannot tell you how stoked I am to after this pandemic's over to still have to wear an N95 once a week. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You really sound uh, stellar. <laughs> 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 so we have a few more right. things to say on the topic of evolution I yeah guess. well first Nick uh, <laughs> you were the one who suggested stop saying the quote unquote which uh, I very much appreciate that advice because um, and I think you're talking about when I'm reading news stories I'm just taking it personally and uh, <laughs> I stopped doing that last week <laughs> cause, uh, and it was it was way better he was quote unquote taking it personally. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Russ does it really well. So if it's being done bad, it's probably me and this is Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> if it's being done well, it's it's Russ. <laughs> but I was never able to do it right. Probably uh, yeah. It is funny that the people can't tell us apart. So often we get emails and they're like, Russ said something and it was something that Kyle totally said. And then they're like, and then Kyle said this really dumb thing and it was something that I said. So that happens. <laughs> I don't know why that happens. And it all happened because neither of them listened to me. <laughs> <laughs> or you gave us totally wrong information, yeah. which definitely at least once happened. <laughs> Never going to live that down, watcher. All right, so what else did we, we... Well, a couple of things I wanted to point out is that there has been a quite an evolution in our thinking. Mine, specifically, I'm talking about myself personally, but on the, on the subject of evolution. And, and you were right, Nick, that we were raised... When we were, when we were growing up, it was like, oh, this is, this is BS, you know, uh, learning about it. And it was... Just... Yeah, for a while we were in the 6K... Christian thing. I mean, that's basically what it was for a while. Not the whole time, but we were definitely in a church that was, that thought that way for a while. Yeah. So, yeah. So there, it, that has changed and that changed a long time ago to, yeah. to looking at it and, and, and looking at life in general and wondering, okay, how did this happen? You know? Uh, and that's, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, I point out that, you know, evolution is probably the best theory that's out there. It does have holes. Uh, and those are some of the areas that we we're, we're asking questions like about speciation and and um, specifically speciation through random mutation. Right. And uh, another big question is, why did it begin in the first place? Life. You know, and, yeah. and that's one of the things I really like about uh, Dr. Chandra's work is, and on the interview that we had specifically where he, we asked him this question and he was thinking, you know, maybe to understand life, you have to go all the way back to the Big Bang. Right? Yeah. Which is also a theory. Yeah. And so, you know, I question the Big Bang. But it is, it is a pretty good idea. It's a pretty good model. Yeah. Um, and the, the possibility that life, like Russ was saying earlier, is fundamental and that you would have to go back to that consciousness point. Consciousness is fundamental. Or consciousness, yeah. But th- that you would have to go back to that point in, in the universe to really discover the roots 
ultimately of life is uh, it's a really intriguing idea to me. Um, but then back to, you know, the idea of viruses coming in and editing DNA, that seems like a really, to me, more plausible uh, Model. mechanism yeah. for speciation than, than survival of the fittest, which is the scenario you laid out with the fish. Right. right. Yeah. Becoming a an amphibian. Now, has that happened? Maybe. Yeah. But does it does that explain all of the developments of life? I don't know. Like we we've talked about the eyeball. How did that ever come into existence? Yeah. Non reducible structures in in biology, things that you can't really grow piecemeal and have any of the parts make sense until you have all the parts together. Uh. You know, now there are things like I, I think I was talking about this with somebody, maybe it was with uh, the stash. When we were talking about the planarian worm may have one of the most ru uh, rudimentary eye types. It's basically just a photoreceptor that can tell if there's light or not. Mm -hmm. But still, it's a complicated structure involving nerves and a part of the a, a part of the nervous cluster or brain or whatever you call it in the worm that can process that information and do something with it and then the photoreceptors it's themselves and those have to be connected and you can't really have any parts of that in other words you can't grow it piecemeal right, and have right. any of the parts make any kind of evolutionary sense right like you can't have like some you nubs couldn't have that... a cornea or retina just by itself yeah or because an optic it would literally serve no function and make no sense. Right. Or an optic nerve or a part of the brain that's the optic center without the eye. Right. I mean you know, so it's it's there are non reducible structures that don't that you can't you can't develop through minute adaptations. Uh, so those are interesting too. I don't I'm I, again I don't think that those disprove anything. I do think that those are serious questions that need to be asked. Now, one way you could get a non-reducible structure is if some virus shows up and swaps out a giant chunk of DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's DNA in there that has the whole structure built into it, right? I yeah. don't know if that would actually this, work. Well, but. this is the kind of thing about, about mutation, right? The, the, the idea of mutation developing things that are totally useless, that eventually either kill the species yeah. or that particular development ends up dying out and the, the species, the rest of the species that doesn't have that development don't advance or, or continue to advance while that one doesn't, right? Yeah, so the yeah. idea is that I, I would say probabilistically, <laughs> probabilistically <laughs> that you would have more uh, negative developments than you would have positive ones. Way more, yeah. Right. If it was if it was purely mutation, right? Now you've tried to combine the idea of, of weird mutations with adaptation, and there's no how, how do those work together? Right. The, there's no reason why they should. Random mutations should not have some mechanism that's noticing a, ne a necessity of something in the environment. Yeah. A random mutation would be completely random and have nothing to do with the environment. So you should have cases all over the place of random mutations that are completely useless. Yeah. And now maybe you could point certain things out like that in, in nature. It was like, wow, this animal has this weird knob and it doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know? <laughs> A weird knob. <laughs> <laughs> and there's all kinds of weird nerves in, in it that don't do anything and don't lead to the brain or whatever. You know, yeah. I mean... I don't know. I'm not a biologist, but it's it's Could it be called a nerve knob. <laughs> the nerve knob. <laughs> Look at this weird nerve knob. <laughs> but yeah, when you when you throw in random mutation and you try to combine that with adaptation, they they don't necessarily work together. Is my point? Yeah. So yes. And one thing that a lot of people don't um, tend to include in the current evolutionary model is when they do the math, they're like, okay, so this often you can have a mutation. Right, but almost every mutation is non-viable and will create what's called a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage of the fetus because the genetic code is altered in such a way that it's non-viable. Yeah. And when you take that into consideration, you have to take the numbers that they're working with and extend them out by like 10 to the fourth power. 
Yeah. And, and the vast majority of mutations that take place in a DNA are not in the re reproductive ones and they don't get like, let's say that some animal gets some part of its DNA mutated. It isn't passed on necessarily. Right. Right. Or it could just be that his fingernails are slightly longer and it does nothing like <laughs> the slightly to longer. get. <laughs> I have that problem. <laughs> oh, well, see, there you go. The. <laughs> The concept of a chain of mutations or mutation that takes a flopping fish that is starving for oxygen with gills and suddenly sprouts working lungs, it, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible. What I'm saying is that probably realistically, <laughs> it's very, very difficult to fathom. Right. And it's all, that's also what we, we were talking about during the break. That's the the... I kind of ranted about this early on in the podcast about post uh, uh, post predicting things that happened in the past, <laughs> you know, <laughs> using probability to predict happened. something that already took place. Yeah. And so you can kind of like mess with numbers like that, but it doesn't really tell you very much. Right. Because it already happened. So how do we know how like probable or improbable it is, except for ba you have to base it on current on current understanding, which is constantly changing. All of this is good. The point is, is that what I think our basic stance on evolution is that it takes place, but the mechanisms aren't necessarily fully understood. Yeah, I would agree with that. And yes. that, and again, I would say that that doesn't. And so, so we, we therefore on the podcast or when we're just talking with each other or the three of us or whatever, when we're talking about evolution, we're constantly asking each other, well, what other mechanisms are possible? Now, that doesn't mean that we immediately jump to because, you know, in in the email, you talked about the spirit thing and you don't buy that. Well, that's not the only, you know, one of the possibilities is that there is some kind of consciousness realm and that's affecting everything. And maybe that's what's happening. But that's just one possibility. We're not married to any of them. We like to talk about them all. Like another one I was thinking of when we were talking about this is like, you know, a lot of people are very they very much like the simulation theory. I've talked about this in some way, talking about how this, that, that, that there are some good thinkers that talk about how this universe seems to be a realm of pure information. Now, that everything is information, obviously, right? But what, what that means, in, in, you can translate that to say that this is some sort of simulated environment, that the whole universe is a simulation in some way. Some people take it all the way to like, you know, say like this, like just like a video game, let's talk about it in terms of a video game because we can all understand that. Well, most of us can understand it, that in a video game, especially the really complicated ones, the video game is set up to only render what you're looking at. And this is an interesting thing to some people who talk about quantum physics and how look at us looking at stuff changes it right now. Kyle has his his way of saying that that's not really ah! <laughs> it's not really said in the correct way <laughs> but it's interesting because in a simulation that's what you would do to save on processing power the 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 CPU that's running the simulation is only going to render the shit that's being looked at at the at that moment everything else is sort of running in the in background limbo, yeah yeah it's, it's in the limbo it's there it's in the code but it isn't being rendered yeah and so as the as the field of view Pa, you know, pans around and looks at various things. And, they, you know, the other thing that we do in simulations in real, real, like in video games and stuff is the stuff that's really far away is low resolution. <laughs> you know, it's real far away and you don't really have to see it clearly. So we kind of put some haze on it and kind of make it blurry and it doesn't matter that it's low resolution. So, but if this is some kind of simulated, purely informational universe, and let's take this just in the materialist idea of it, that, that, that there's a simulation and it's being run by some other realm that, that if we could leave the simulation, we would be a, a player in the real universe or whatever. Well, that would explain evolution. Now, does it explain evolution in that real universe or how did life come about in that one? No, it's kind of a kicking in the can down the road. But you can this is another possible way to talk about why why evolution is is takes place in big jumps and things change drastically all at once. You know, somebody's rewriting the, the the simulation. They're like, "All right, let's get rid of the dinosaurs. Everybody's bored of that. Let's like 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 we're we're putting out the new DLC that has all the mammals, <laughs> right?" <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots of different ways to talk about evolution, and lots of interesting ways to explore other possible mechanisms that aren't the purely neo-Darwinist 
Like everything has happened by accident, accidental mutation, followed by adapt, adapt, ad, adaptive processes that lead to changing in uh, animal types. You know, one of the interesting ones that I've looked at is the changing that the what is apparent. Now, this isn't really clear, but it's interesting. And there are some museums that show this, that uh, Megalodon. Is that the right? Yeah. The name of the giant shark. Yes. The Megalodon. The Megalodon teeth. OK. And they have this array of them and they start out looking like just giant shark teeth. But over time, you see that they become more and more serrated. And right, this is usually put in this, it's, it's put in a, 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 a row so you can be like, look, here's this evolutionary process where this shark gets, you know, goes from having a, a smooth knife teeth to like a, a steak knife teeth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is a, a, given as an example of an evolutionary or adaptive, adaptive process. Now, again, I have to immediately point out that the tooth structure already existed and it's just changing it minutely in the same way that like a moth changing from one color to another is changing minutely. It doesn't really, that doesn't, I, I can look at that process and say, oh, wow, look at that adaptation. If it even took place, because there, because the problem with these kind of fossils is they're old enough to where you can't really date them with any kind of tight margin of error. So who knows if there were just some megalodon with incredibly serrated teeth and other ones that didn't have them and they've put them in a row. Yeah, because they think this is an adaptation, but it's not necessarily that because the, the margins of error on the dating are freaking hundreds of thousands of years. Right. Right. And we. Uh, OK, I don't want to derail you. Keep yeah, going. don't don't derail me, bro. <laughs> no, it's all right. But I'm just what I'm saying is, is like we have looked into this and there's lots of interesting stuff. <clears throat> but that progress, that process of let's say that it did take place like that and this teeth grew more and more serrated. Well, that that adapt adaptive process does not. You can't extend that process of teeth changing into something completely different. In other words, changing an exist, existing structure to be a little bit different, especially if it's just teeth or the color of some thing like a scales on the moth wings or whatever. That doesn't actually result in new structure. Yeah. You can't take that teeth example and try to figure out how you can continue changing the teeth until you suddenly have a different species right. that can't breed with each other. Yeah, and we talk about this in terms of, um, you know, recessive genes, like what traits are being expressed. Yeah. And those come and go. And then, the, you know, we're studying... We're studying the, the genetic code, and there's just so much information in there that apparently is not being used. Right. So it is that that's another mystery. It's like, how do we know that, you know, they say they say things like our our genes are like two percent different than some other. I can't remember what the other the is, chimpanzee some, or yeah, something, champ, like that, yeah. something like that. Um, as as though. Like that, that's proof in some way or suggestive that we that we evolved from the chimp which it could be yeah but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the the answer right uh it's it's interesting to to imagine that the dna itself is not is um expressing certain things like we the 98 percent of our dna that we don't understand or that we don't know what it's for could be able to express so uh, us in such a different way that we wouldn't recognize ourselves, right? Yeah. We wouldn't recognize them as humans. I don't know. I just. Yeah. And I think that like, again, with the, I, with the, the moth changing color, like I, I immediately think of things like eye color in people. Now it's, it's di more difficult to show that as a, like, this is a slow adaptive process. But it is easy to point out that like different eye colors show up in people because of recessive or dominant genes. Right now, people don't die, live or die based on the color of their eyes. But if they did, you would end up with most with all humans have the same color eye. If they started out if everybody started out having brown eyes and then the uh, <clears throat> the, the environment changed such that. Only humans with light eyes would tend to survive. Eventually, everybody would have light eyes. And that's not evolution because those that those genes are already in us. That's what yeah, I'm that's yeah, what yeah. I'm trying that's, to get at. Yes. 
<clears throat> I would also say that it assumes that those moths don't have a type of active camouflage. Geckos and, you know, other lizards will change to their surroundings. What happened was during the Industrial Revolution, massive amounts of coal soot started being spit out into London and yeah. the surrounding areas. And so they became darker with darker speckles. Right. Who's to say that if it would have been green, they wouldn't have turned they would have turned green. I mean, it could be like it assumes a lot. You're you're talking about more of a um like a long term camouflage type of thing that's already built in to their, their right. DNA. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, exactly. we, we don't know. We yeah. don't know. We don't know. I think that's the, the main point we're always trying to make here on Brothers of the Servant Podcast is that we don't know. And we like to explore other possibilities because, as we've also said before, we know the story that most people talk about and learn about in, in these kinds of subjects. Like, yeah, we've heard the evolution story. We know the story about the fish that eventually gets feet. Okay? <laughs> we have definitely heard that story before. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so what do we come up with Co the simulation idea the the cosmic evolution that's uh, that's my favorite one i like the idea of viruses and viruses changing things around but that you get into the chicken and the egg problem with yeah, viruses I know, like you've got to start you've got to have dna to, to switch around and that goes that's <laughs> once again goes back to how did life begin question because right, if, yeah. if evolution is a process that happens in biology how does biology come to be in the first place? Is that another type of evolution, the evolution of stuff in the universe? Right. I mean, you and could... The, and the fact that there's now pretty good evidence that life shows up almost as soon as the surface of the planet cools enough for there to be standing water is another, is another good indication that maybe what we're talking about is a cosmic process rather than a planetary one. That the you know that that life already existed in the cosmos and it showed up here as soon as it could, <laughs> as soon as it wasn't basically lava. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I've seen also the also... I've also seen the argument that hot that very hot bedrock lava stuff, uh, mixing with you know with with weird water coming from cometary impacts and stuff makes a great kind of prim primordial soup a hot active electrochemical situation where you may have a much higher chance of the of these kinds of complex proteins coming together and forming something interesting that is self replicating and can store all kinds of information maybe that did maybe that is what happened you know the whole primordial soup idea change the affinities of molecules in solution to form bonds though that's my big issue is that you have so many things that are going to eat hydrogen and form bonds before you even come close to nitrogenous compounds, that the math becomes astounding. Ah. Uh, okay. Unless you have something that changes the fundamental dynamics of chemistry as we know it now. But do, 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 but do you think if you extend that out into the entire cosmos that maybe it could happen by accident? It, that's that's the idea. Like the, yeah, with the one of the things that I liked about the work of. Um, Dr. Wick Ramasinga is that it takes that improbable math and spreads it over every possible spot in the, the entire known universe. Right. Yeah. And then there's a mechanism for sharing it, for sharing the information via viruses. Right. And not only that, but it also takes it 14 billion years into the past or however long people think the universe is, however old it is. And also puts it, if, if, if he was right and he says that it may start with the big bang, well, the big bang does change the laws of physics at the very beginning. Also very true. So, yes, you can overcome those chemical problems you were just talking about in the very early parts of the Big Bang where everything was still quarks or whatever. And another thing is that the concept of nanotechnology, right? We currently have theoretically and are pursuing and having success with designing little tiny machines that will go in and fix stuff and change DNA like a virus. Yeah. Right. Viruses do seem like a very advanced version of uh, nanotechnology. So advanced that and, it looks like biology to us. We're just used to it, right? Right. And so to me, if that's the mechanism that we have discovered on our own that is feasible and doable, 
it just seems fairly logical to make the sidestep and go, well, why can't something else be doing that all the time? Yeah. It's simple. Darwinian evolution requires a crap ton of rotating parts. Yeah. Whereas this other option is just simple. And so to me, that that's why I prefer it. But it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It just, that's why I like it more. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of a sci-fi I read one time. <laughs> <laughs> the premise on it was that, uh, I see if I can even express this properly. The premise was that at the in the very early universe, some kind of life appeared, not life, consciousness, more energy based. Like think Boltzmann brain, but it shows up in the very energetic early universe. Mm -hmm. And then the universe turns in very quickly, turns into something that isn't isn't suitable to that particular kind of life. Okay. So it was able to sequester itself inside of this sort of a big bang generated very energetic black hole system. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, now now it's in a time dilation. Okay. And think you could think of it as a kind of a computer type a data type life. It's mm -hmm. pure information running around in, in very high energy states that it, there's no matter there's no really matter involved here. It's just extremely high energy, the stuff that happens right after the Big Bang. And this life is not very pleased with what the universe becomes and it realizes that right at the big bang that certain physical laws were set that made the universe eventually end up like this and it was like well now we're in this time dilated thing and well let's 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 mess with stuff until we can make the universe go back and start over and do a new big bang and maybe we can tweak it to where it'll be like we want it to be so they are the reason life exists in the first place because they're trying to hasten entropy oh uh, yes <laughs> Yes. So the reason that bio that DNA based biological life exists in the first place is because they're they're in their time dilation hole watching the universe evolve and they realize it gets to a point and entropy it's starts to forever. sort of freeze. Yeah, and they're like, God, this is gonna take a long time. <laughs> Let's make something that can break down these complex chemicals yes. so that entropy will hasten and we can make the universe start over faster. <laughs> so there you go. Explanation for evolution. Lots of great ideas on these kinds of on these kinds of things. <laughs> And yeah, Nick, another thing I would remind you of is like, I read so much sci-fi that you have to know <laughs> that I have read a lot about evolution because most of the sci-fi guys that I used to read were hardcore materialists and they explained the universe in hundreds of possible ways. All of them were materialist reductionists and there was very few, uh, pretty much none of them were spiritual yeah. guys, except for uh, Heinlein might've had some weird psychic stuff that he played around with every once in a while, but most of them were hardcore reductionists, and so yes, I am very familiar with lots of different interesting and cool ways to look at macroevolution in the sense of the whole cosmos taking place and sometimes some giant, massive, ancient energy alien actually doing the whole thing to make it happen faster. <laughs> yeah, I stopped going to the library a long time ago to look at Russ's bookshelf. Uh, that one. <laughs> Dude, that uh, that whole concept's actually interesting. I think in Arkansas, I was telling History Shift because he asked me, you know, like, well, what do you think about simulation theory? It's like, do you really want to know? <laughs> and I was like, what I think is, it's a no point because kicks the can. If yeah, well, no, if we were dealing with the fundamentals of this universe, right, we would be essentially tweaking source code. Yeah. And when we would design these AI constructs, what would we be using? The source code from around us. So regardless of whether or not this is a simulation, we have no way of ever knowing. So don't worry about it. Yeah. And if, yeah, I mean, the other thing about simulation theory is that if it's true that eventually all computational processes can get complex enough to the point to where you can start actually simulating the universe to the point to where you can't tell the difference between being in a simulated universe and not being in one, then what's the point? And that's the in that scenario, it you can't even tell how far down the chain you are because every even the simulated universes will eventually get computational processes complex enough to simulate universes in that universe. You just explained quantum mechanics. And so, yeah, so I'm just saying, like, you, <laughs> uh, we might be hundreds and hundreds of simulations down the chain from the real world, quote unquote, quote unquote. 
<laughs> I think they did that in a Star Ocean game where you actually are in a game, but then you jump out of the game into the real world. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Star Ocean till the end of time. There you go. Great, Great game. game. Yep. <laughs> 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 what time we got? What are we What are we out here? Uh, we got some time. Then we start that late? A All little right. bit, yeah. So here's another one. This guy uh, is Eugene McCarthy. He's a PA, He's got a PhD in genetics. Uh, and I've been looking into this. I actually tried to get him on the show. He was on... The, he was on Grimerica, so if anybody's interested, I would recommend they go check out Grimerica show episode number 232. Um, he, gave, he gave them a, a pretty good interview. And when I, but when I, I guess he's tired of podcasts because when I asked him, he's like, no, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> he doesn't want to go on podcasts anymore. But So I went to his website, which is called macroevolution.net. <laughs> this is a geneticist and he's got a completely new idea on how evolution may take place and it's it's it has nothing it's it's very interesting it's based on his ideas of genetics it has nothing to do with any spirit realm or consciousness stuff, stuff or whatever this is a very materialist mechanistic but interesting idea uh and i guess i would i would sum it up in saying that he looks very he looks a lot at hybridization okay so here's, here's one of his intros on here. He says, this is on the origins of new forms of life. He says, how does evolution occur? That is, what natural processes bring new types of organisms into being? Expressed more technically, one might ask, what are the genetic processes that have produced the various forms that scientists recognize and assign scientific names? This is the question considered in the analysis of evolutionary theory presented on this website. There is, of course, a great mass of literature already available on this topic. But my own more than 20-year investigation of that literature has convinced me that certain widely accepted claims about the nature of evolutionary processes represent little more than unsubstantiated dogma, as unsupported by replicable experiment as the events described in Genesis. I readily admit that many of the claims made by my fe fellow evolutionary biologists are in fact correct and entirely reasonable, but some are inconsistent with fact and, in my opinion, the corresponding aspects of evolutionary theory need adjustment. By collecting all the relevant facts together here, I hope to lead you to the same conclusion. It remains true, as R.S. Crane liked to say, that, quote, there is no authority but evidence. Unquote. On this website, I have gathered evidence of all sorts that seem to have any direct bearing on the question at hand. Moreover, I have tried to present that evidence in such a way that a non-biologist can understand it. Oop. Man. <laughs> Rookie move. Rookie move. Hate to see it happen. <clears throat> Everything just came in at once. Uh, okay, so non-biologist can understand it so long as he or she reads the information in the order that it is presented. I have done so because I believe the issues considered here are of vital concern, not only to the few people who call themselves evolutionary biologists, but also to humanity as a whole. For the last 150 years, we biologists have been defending a fortress built by Charles Darwin. We have spent our energies hurling back the assaults of the creationist infidels and shoring up a slowly crumbling foundation that once seemed based on the hard bedrock of direct observation. But an ocean of data, accumulating since 1859, has been slowly lapping away at the rotten stone beneath Darwin's castle, undermining its moldering walls, making it an ever more dangerous place to reside. As Darwin's most eloquent proponent, T.H. Huxley, once said, Every great truth begins as heresy and ends as superstition. <laughs> <laughs> In the case of evolutionary theory, Huxley appears to have been right. Many of the facts presented in the discussion of evolution on this website do indeed suggest that certain elements of Darwin's heresy can now best be interpreted as a kind of superstition. It was Huxley, too, who warned us not to pretend that conclusions are certain which are not dem demonstrated or demonstrable. I will argue that certain important tenets of modern evolutionary theory actually do fail or do fall into this category. I want to present the facts that compelled me to abandon my former ideas on how evolution occurs. As we shall see, a different account of the evolutionary process is far easier to defend on an evidentiary basis than is the one given by most biology texts. According to this alternative view, which I call stabilization theory, 
Certain genetic processes known to disrupt the normal reproductive cycle are the typical source of new types of organisms. A variety of these stabilization processes are described on this website. Although stabilization theory is a new explanation as a whole, its intellectual components have a long tradition in biological thought, and all the phenomena it invokes are all well-known and well-documented. Presenting those components, providing examples of the phenomena involved, and discussing the relevant aspects of the history of biology and of bio biological thought will require many pages of evidence and discussion. But I suspect many readers will have a very different idea of the nature of evolution by the time they have digested what I have to say. The orthodox account of evolution is based on the ideas of Charles Darwin and the findings of Gregor Mendel. The most common name for this theory is Neo-Darwinism, although it is also known as the Modern Synthesis, which is often capitalized, or the Synthetic Theory. It supposes that in the course of evolution, the typical new form arises from a pre-existing form via the gradual accumulation of distinctive traits. In other words, the new characteristics are acquired in sequence over time, not all at once. Most of these traits are assumed to be advantageous to reproduction and therefore to accumulate under the influence of natural selection. As Darwin puts it in Origin of Species, quote, Whatever the cause may be of each slight difference in the offspring from their parents, and a cause for each must exist, it is the steady accumulation through natural selection of such differences when beneficial to the individual that gives rise to all the more important modifications of structure by which the innumerable beings on the face of this earth are enabled to struggle with each other and the best adapted to survive, unquote. <clears throat> The process of accumulation is usually described as occurring in a population that does not interbreed or does not interbreed significantly with other similar populations. Many people think such a proposition is necessary because they believe the genetic influence of interbreeding would otherwise prevent the evolving population from accumulating distinctive traits. This is one of the superstitions. Under this scheme, as two populations descended from a common ancestral population become increasingly distinct, they are said to diverge. They were once the same, but depart from each other in character. The idea of natural selection can be described as follows. 1. The individual members of a natural population differ with respect to heritable traits having a differential effect on the ability to survive and reproduce, and 2. Traits favoring survival and reproduction are more likely to be passed on to the next generation. They are naturally selected, just as breeder artificially selects particular traits. Thus, under this view of the evolutionary process, traits favoring survival and successful reproduction will tend to accumulate over time and bring about changes in the affected form. This mechanism seems so obvious that it is hard at first to see any way it could be mistaken. The idea of an accumulation of differences resulting in gradual divergence, and ultimately in the production of new types of organisms, is axiomatic in neo-Darwinian theory, and is therefore the orthodox account of evolution. Scientists who hold such views believe evolution is the result of ongoing change within isolated populations, which supposedly causes the divergence of those populations. Thus, two well-known evolutionary biologists, Daniel L. Hartle and Andrew J. Clark, assert that fundamentally, evolution is the result of progressive change in the genetic composition of a population. All right, we need to take a break. Yeah. But this guy's good, right? This yeah, good that's stuff. good stuff. Yeah. All we right, will, we will continue with more of this after the break. Institute for Advanced Copperlite Studies, where there are no degrees, only certificates of ignorance, which you have to draw with crayons or <laughs> type and print yourself. So yeah, this is this is cool stuff, man. Yeah. So more, more. 
The last thing I read was the quote from a couple of evolutionary biologists who assert that fundamentally evolution is the result of progressive change in the genetic composition of a population. So, continuing on here, he says, Over the last decade, the neo-Darwinian perspective has been extensively, extensively criticized, but no one has offered a coherent theory to replace it. Bingo. Here on this website, however, I attempt to do just that. I also do my best to explain why this alternative theory is preferable to the neo-Darwinian explanation of evolution. The approach I have used in constructing my argument is simple. I identify claims supporting neo-Darwinian theory that are widely accepted but poorly documented and then examine them in the light of evidence. In his book, The Great Chain of Being, Arthur Lovejoy comments that there are implicit or incompletely explicit assumptions or more or less unconscious mental habits operating in the thought of an individual or a generation. It is the beliefs which are so much a matter of course that they are rather tacitly presupposed than formally expressed and argued for, the ways of thinking which seem so natural and inevitable that they are not scrutinized with the eye of logical self-consciousness that often are most decisive of the character of a philosopher's doctrine and still oftener of the dominant intellectual tendencies of an age. Biologists, he says, are no exception to this rule. During the course of my study of evolutionary thought, I became aware that there are indeed certain tacit presupp presuppositions made by many of my colleagues, ways of thinking, as Lovejoy puts it, which seem so natural and inevitable that they are not scrutinized. Indeed, for a long time, I embraced many of these same assumptions myself. So long as they do escape scrutiny, these presuppositions seem to clearly demonstrate the validity of neo-Darwinian theory. But these claims cannot stand direct examination. If I have properly done my work, by the end of this discussion, each such fallacious assumption will have been spelled out and the exact nature of the errors associated with each will have been made explicit. Let the reader be forewarned, then, that certain conclusions taken for granted within the context of neo-Darwinian theory cannot be taken for granted here. Stabilization theory posits axioms that differ from and that are even logically inconsistent with those of neo-Darwinism. Therefore, anyone who accepts the standard view of evolution will have to proceed with caution. The discussion on this website focuses on the validity of axioms. It attempts to show that the axioms on which stabilization theory is based are more valid, that is, are more consistent with available evidence than are those of neo-Darwinism. Consequently, it will not be possible, nor would it be fair for the reader to judge between neo-Darwinian theory and stabilization theory merely by considering whether the claims of stabilization theory are consistent with the claims of the standard view. Here, the standard view itself is at stake. The discrimination must instead be based on whether available evidence, that is, empirical data, better supports the assumptions of one view or the other. If neo-Darwinism is flawed in its very axioms, then inferences based on that view should not be taken for granted. Therefore, even when the assertions of stabilization theory radically contradict widely accepted claims concerning the nature of the evolutionary process, I ask the reader to look first to the evidence and not to dismiss my claims simply because they conflict with the traditional view. Hybridization plays a much more important and a different role in stabilization theory than it does in neo-Darwinian theory. The word hybrid has been defined in various ways, but a particular definition is well suited to stabilization theory. If two populations are consistently distinct with respect to one or more characters, and if a descendant of matings between those populations is discernibly mixed with respect to those characters, then that individual is a hybrid, and any process producing such individuals is hybridization. Note that population here refers to any set of organisms defined by a particular set of characteristics. Although hybrids are often less fertile than either of their parents, the degree of fertility varies greatly from one hybrid individual to another. And many are fully capable of producing offspring. For this web reason, on this website, the term partially fertile is used to describe hybrids that can produce progeny, since merely saying fertile or sterile under such circumstances would be misleading. Hmm. Typically, they are either fully fertile or typically they are neither fully fertile nor entirely sterile. Wow. So that when I was listening to him, he points this out multiple times. He's got a couple of good videos on this website, too. They're very short. You can watch them, and it kind of, he kind of introduces the idea. But 
he points out that to say that something is entirely sterile is not right. It's actually more of a percentage game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Hybrids are very much less fertile than non-hybrids, but they can still have offspring. It's just more rare for it to work. Hmm. Okay? They have all the equipment. So I wonder if, like, if a hybrid <laughs> successfully has offspring with, like, the parent species. Yeah. Does that baby or that... He does talk about that, and it gets into a lot of DNA crap that I don't understand. Okay, yeah, but yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, he talks about <laughs> does that. Does that like, baby become more... Like the yeah, the he's like, well, if a diploid mates with a tetraploid and blah blah blah, and I'm yeah. just like, okay, bro, you already lost me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys uh, familiar with uh, servals? Nope. The, the African jungle cats. No, no. So, um, the way that they work is based on the number of generations they're separated from the wild version. They categorize them in F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5 with one. One or five is like super crazy jungle cat. And then the other opposite end of the scale is a more like a house cat, but still a super crazy jungle cat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about and right. And the way that they determine that is the number of ways that they're bred back to each other. So if you start with a wild serval and it breeds with one that's been, you know, kept completely like domesticated or something. Let's right. just use and that for, be, for so, better, yeah. lack of a better It's kind of like that sort of scale. Based on how many ways you breed back and forth, you'll have a sliding of the expression of the traits. Yeah. And he has, so, the other thing I would point out on this website is he has an enormously amazing list of known and even reported hybrid types that go way beyond anything I've ever heard about. Really cool and interesting stuff. He's mm. like, he's like, some of these are known possible hybrids, and then here's a bunch that have been reported, you know. And here's what people say about these reported oh, things. Like these two random animals made it, and then yeah. they had a. And you're like, yeah, and he starts out with like here are ones that are based, you know, like two different kinds of cat, like a liger, uh, you know, yeah. a lion yeah, and a tiger. This is a known one. Does he have the liger. Yeah, he has totally has the liger. That's at the top of the list. But oh, as, yeah. you, as you go farther oh, yeah. down the list, he gets into ones where they're like completely different kinds of of animals totally like not even in the same <laughs> range of like how you know like a monkey and a pig and you're like what is happening here <laughs> is this Whoa, really dude. going on <laughs> and they've been and they, it's yeah yeah he just he he kind of gives you gives them to you on a scale of of most common to like to like just rarely reported but still reported nonetheless by you know at least seemingly re respectable people huh. and That's uh insane. but he points like out of dr moreau Yes. Yeah. And he, he talks, I'll, I'll probably get into some of the hybrid stuff if we have time here, but he says, okay. So you're telling me that the Egyptian carvings with like dudes with bird heads could actually be <laughs> Could legit. actually be possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He says most, but not all of the evolutionary processes posited by stabilization theory involve hybridization, which is the topic of section two. The evolutionary discussions on this website is broken up topically into sections. Okay, so he says, however, it should be emphasized that the discussion here will focus on the question of how new types of organisms come into being, not on the various neo-Darwinian claims about the significance of hybridization. The method I follow is to compare at a philosophical level the relative merits of two explanations of how evolution takes place, stabilization theory and neo-Darwinian theory. That is, once stabilization theory has been fully explained, we will consider, in sections 6, 7, 8, and 9, a series of phenomena, and in the case of each, we will evaluate which of the two theories provides a better explanation. Not wishing to bore the reader with extraneous considerations, I have tried to limit discussion to those cases where such discriminations can actually be made. To discuss all the phenomena that both theories explain equally well, and there are many, but would be pointless and tedious. So the discussion, as presented here, focuses on those phenomena and the associated explanations of those phenomena that will help the reader decide which of the two theories is a better explanation. Because the processes it emphasizes produce new types of organisms in relatively rapid and abrupt manner, Stabilization theory undermines a primary tenet of neo-Darwinian theory, the claim that evolution is typically a process involving the gradual accumulation of differences within an evolving population. 
Stabilization theory does not, however, entirely dismiss the mechanisms described in neo-Darwinian theory. It merely claims that they are relevant only within a restricted domain. It does, however, claim that stabilization processes are the main source of new types of organisms. So what I want to point out here is what he's saying is that he still thinks the adaptation part of neo-Darwinism is a good is is a good and we right. see this happen. What he's saying is his hybridization and stabilization theory explains the speciation problem. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> This difference in emphasis is justified because such processes are now known to be far more widespread than was once thought. Moreover, the expected pattern of evolutionary change produced by such processes matches the pattern of change actually observed in the fossil record. These processes are also far better documented than many of the mechanisms described in neo-Darwinian theory. They therefore can justifiably claim a larger place in theory. The information and arguments presented on this website, then, represent an effort to bring theory in line with currently available data. The discussion reviews empirical evidence both from the standpoint of evolutionary phenomena requiring explanations and from the standpoint of observed phenomena that might provide those explanations. If you want to read the arguments sequentially and see all the evidence I have gathered to support stabilization theory... You can simply go to the next page and keep reading. <clears throat> However, if you're familiar with the evidence showing that new types of organisms can be produced rapidly or, or in one or a few generations and are familiar with fossil evidence showing that this sort of evolution is typical, then I suggest you'd skip straight to section seven. It is the first of the four sections focusing on stabilization theory. The first six sections are devoted to presenting evidence and discussing philosophical issues. Okay. <clears throat> so let me... Uh Go ahead. How long? I mean, can this we, website is enormous. It's. I'd be down to like because we're in the last segment. I'd be down to like do another show with this. Yeah, we like, could definitely do another show with it. Yeah. So let's let's. Uh, so I'll just put this down for now and kind of let's try to give a brief description of what he's talking about. And I don't know because I'm not a, a an evolutionary biologist nor am I a geneticist, <laughs> but the premise of what he's saying seems to be that hybrids. Uh, is a something that we know takes place and that none of them are necessarily sterile. They're just less fertile, more or less fertile, right? Well, okay, they're always less fertile than their parent species. Mm -hmm. um, but well, they, are, yeah. they are not entirely sterile. They may not have always been. We don't have all of the species that ever existed on the planet to That's test. Right. That's true. So there, sh there could be some cases where animals that exist now were very fertile hybrids of previous animals. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That like this this kind of okay, this is making me think of the the whole extinction level event type of thing and then the explosion of life. Like that scenario sort of forces the the hybridization to happen. Yeah. Because a bunch of animals die. Like you were pointing this out during the break. Yeah. And like you were saying in a catastrophe. Yeah. You know, like the vast majority of one particular species may die off in a particular area and all that's left are scattered members of different species, but the sexual drive doesn't go away. Right. The drive to reproduce. And so this makes actual, what I guess what you would call attempts at hybridization much more likely to take place. Right. Yeah. And, and because of and that, you might find that there are obviously there would be some hybrids that are more fertile. Yeah. That's and right. They would, you know, that were never really, quote unquote, quote unquote, tested <laughs> out. Sorry. <laughs> I know. I've been, I've been saying it a bunch on purpose. <laughs> They're not really, quote unquote, tested. Okay. <laughs> Stop saying quote unquote. But, but, but a massive catastrophe makes it much more likely for, you know, a mouse to try to bone something that's not a mouse. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they all, they all, air quotes, test this out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting. Doing it for science. That's been one of my biggest issues with standard evolution and one of the ways that uh, space virus evolution totally works and originally i thought i was like oh well he's not going to be able to explain that and then this dude totally went and explained it so i have to respect it well let's yeah. also look at this other aspect like we we raised <clears throat> sheep right we raised a bunch of them finally sold them all thank god but uh 
And then he bought five more. <laughs> but damn the, it, the problem you have in in a in an uh, sort of an isolated selection of yeah, one isolated type population. of animal, yeah, they will interbreed to the point of like detrimental to detrimental themselves. to themselves. Yeah. So you want to. You have to, you know, this is what animal husbandry is all about. You're pulling the ones out that you don't want to be breeding. Yeah. Obviously, you're selecting for <clears throat> traits, but, you know, we've talked about the this, this idea that there's like this certain method of breeding like this, you know, with, with the lineage in yeah. a way that actually produces better and better right. uh, progeny. So... Left on to their own devices, isolated from being able, you know, they'll they'll screw themselves up. Yeah, right. That's right. So it's like <clears throat> a the environment being what it is, causing the dispersion and mixing of other. Even if they're of the same species, they have different genetic lines. They, you know, different ancestry. If you would put it that way, on a, yeah, maybe a human term, but. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he also talks about imprinting. And this is a known thing that something that is raised from being a baby, basically, in a group of a different kind of animal, oh, animal sh- will yes. imprint. So like, you know, you got yes. one goat and a bunch of sheep. It totally acts like a sheep yeah. or a donkey surrounded by sheep or whatever, you know, whatever it is that and if it was raised as a baby from that, it imprints more much to have the same sort of habits and things yeah. as that other animal type this makes it also much more likely to try to breed like gus yeah our our freaking wild pig dude. <laughs> well, yeah i was totally ready to breed we, with our sheep we, we put him <laughs> in with the sheep and he thought he was a sheep yeah and he tried to breed with them that's right this yeah. makes hybridization much more likely holy crap so yeah, once again, going back to a catastrophe scenario, yeah, you would have some baby birds. babies yeah, that yeah. their mothers and everything's and, dead. Yeah, and so they're following some other group of animals that are nothing like them, and yeah. eventually they start trying right. to breed with them. Exactly. So I'll just briefly go through a li- he, on the, on here. You got mammalian hybrids. I'm not going to read an article. Do you mind just... if I jump in real quick? Uh, okay, fine. Sorry, I was searching for some data. <laughs> <laughs> the variable. Um, fertility thing right it comes down to the number of chromosomes in the hybrid that's right he talks about a liger a liger has 38 19 in a tiger 19 in a lion and so they have some fertility a mule has 63 an odd number because it gets 62 from the donkey and 64 from the horse and mules are always sterile so when you hybridize you have a strange variation in chromosomes. So the ones that are going to be viable and able to breed have to have an even number. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And they have Uh, to have something else that'll match. Cause when they split during, um, Oh my God, I can't remember the word for this. Um, fertilization. When they split during fertilization, you can't have half of a chromosome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Doesn't make sense. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why? Under mammalian hybrids, he says he's got a list here of intrageneric crosses. Watch or help me on this. Intrageneric means within the same kind of family. Is that what they're talking about? Intra- I believe it's going to be genus. In, Inter- okay. In, in the same genera. Like yeah. zebra and donkey, he's got in here. Red deer and sika, white tail and mule deer, lion, tiger. Leopard and lion, leopard and tiger, jaguar and leopard, jaguar and lion, um, coyote and wolf, right? Right. So these are examples of Canidae, yeah, which would be the the genus uh, for both of those would be like a wolf is Canidae lupin, lupine, lupus, something like that. Yeah. Um, And dog is Canidae familiaris. Yeah. So the genus is one step up from the. The species. species, right. So here is inter intergeneric, right? So this first one was intra within the genera. Now this is intergeneric, in other words, cross genera. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um gorilla and chimpanzee, human and chimpanzee, human and orangutan, dog and maned wolf, goat and something that I can't pronounce, polar bear and brown bear, America, bison, 
Uh, American bison and cattle, goat and sheep. Those are intergeneric crosses. Then he, ha- then he has intersubfamilial crosses. Fox and raccoon dog. Wolf and fox. Dog and fox. Pig and babarusa. Red deer or elk and moose. Mule deer and moose. Cow and sheep. And one avian cross, mallard and Canadian goose. Uh, now he has interfamilial crosses. And these are this is where it starts to get more weird, right? Uh, axis deer and tar, uh, moose and cow. Moose and a cow. Huh. <laughs> Red deer and cow, reindeer and cow, goat and deer. In the carnivores, he's got dog and cat, dog and puma, dog and badger, dog and bear, puma and bear, cat and raccoon, raccoon and fox. Uh, cat and skunk. That's a sign of the end of days, by the way. Dogs <laughs> yeah. and cats breeding. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> Interordinal crosses. Now, remember that the farther down the list we go, the more rare or unlikely these get. But yeah. he's just saying these have all been reported, and he picks the reports that are more or less by respectable people. And in other words, there's no, you know... It's it's kind of you kind of at the very end. I'm thinking you're getting into the like the level of like giant reports. People are like, whatever, yeah. dude. But at the same time, he's like, dude, you know, the people who reported these were not crackpots. Yeah. So, uh, and every one of these is a link that goes to the all the data he's got on it. So I'll just tell people you got to check this website out. Uh, so inner ordinal, um, dog and cow is one example. Bear and cow. <laughs> <laughs> cat and black rat that would never happen <laughs> oh giraffe and zebra deer and horse uh, camel and horse pig and horse uh, sheep and hare rabbit and cow holy crap rabbit and cow <laughs> uh, <laughs> cat plus human <laughs> okay now that there's a lot of evidence for yeah it. that's right <laughs> <laughs> and in avian crosses he's got chicken and duck canary and parakeet pigeon and chicken lie bird and chicken you know so whole list uh, now he's got interclass crosses right owl and rabbit think about this uh, mammal and reptiles here human and snake lots of evidence for that guys <laughs> tons of evidence you're listening to it I mean that's one of the oldest stories <laughs> that's right seal and turtle uh, and now he's got distant non-mammal crosses like fish and frog, sturgeon and alligator, fish and bird, and water snake and chicken. There you go. Now you got a fish that can climb up onto the. That's shore. right. So do you think that's why everything tastes like chicken? Because <laughs> everything's boned to chicken at some point in the past. <laughs> So for those who've never studied biology, I'm going to teach you guys a wonderful mnemonic. Kings play chess on fuzzy green stools. Ah. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, uh, fuzzy. Fuzzy. family, oh, fuzzy. genus, and then species. <laughs> and that's, that's the order that you go down. Oh, that's great. Kings play chess on fuzzy green stools. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks, Watcher. Thanks, buddy. 30% uh, brain expansion. Yeah. Guaranteed. So here, I'm going to read this brief thing. I think we'll do this, and then probably we're running out of time here. A uh, brief thing on what it, his idea of stabilization theory. So he says, The main claims of stabilization theory, which distinguish it from neo-Darwinian theory, can be summarized as follows. <clears throat> One, the typical form treated as a species comes into being via certain well-known well-documented genetic processes that produce new stable forms in an extremely rapid manner and two these processes produce new forms that are for genetic reasons inherently stable from the time of their inception right up to the time of their extinction a corollary of this claim is the theory's assertion that any given type of organism produced by such a process has a negligible tendency to change over time in response to environmental constraints. This is why it's stabilizing. In other words, the, the, the brand new kind of species shows up all at once and by its very nature is stable. Mm-hmm. And all of the little adaptations that take place are not a matter of, of being instable, but are it adapting to various little environmental pressures. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't ever actually, but all the speciation stuff happens, bam, almost instantaneously by some form of weird hybridization, which is probably also generated by strange environmental 
issues. Forces. Yeah. yeah. I think this is a really cool idea. I do too. So he says, these primary tenets of stabilization theory can be contrasted with the following salient claims of neo-Darwinian theory. One, in Darwinian theory, the typical new form treated as distinct species comes into being gradually through the accumulation of certain characteristic traits within an evolving population over time. And two, the accumulation and spread of these traits is due to environmental influences favoring the survival and the reproduction of individuals having such traits. He says, only a few words of difference, but the implications are huge. Consider how extensively Darwinian theory has influenced not only biology, but also society at large. And you will see that the stakes here are incredibly high. What if the axioms of Darwin's theory are actually erroneous? And subsequent discussion will provide excellent reasons for believing that they are actually that they actually are. Then the theory itself is wrong and the entire well, some long German word that I don't know how to pronounce, based upon it is mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what word that is? Welton something shung? No, no idea. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, for example, under stabilization theory, we select and shape our environment. The neo-Darwinian outlook, of course, is just the opposite. Under that view, the environment selects and shapes us. As we shall see, the relative merits of these two hypotheses can in fact be evaluated by considering which of the two is more consistent with available data. So let's look at some examples of stabilization processes. That's really cool. <clears throat> Heck yeah. Drop phone, show done. <laughs> man, I'm glad you joined us here for this second half of the show there, Watcher. Yeah, fantastic input. Me too, man. Uh, and it's interesting, this also solves another issue I've had with the standard model. Explain to me a Longhorn, a Hereford dairy cow, and an Oryx. Or the, God, the one with the Z, the giant African weird horned cow. Like, how are all of those cows? Well, <laughs> let me tell you something about hybridization, son. Like, it makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. I like it. I, I like it. I also like, I mean, think about strange. He, he even gets into uh, the evidence for domestication of plants at the very beginning of human history. And he's like, they were making hybrids. This is why they yes. just appear out of nowhere, fully formed. And you don't have to do this long, gradual, bullshit, neo-Darwinistic process to get them. Mm-hmm. Somebody Your knew grandson's grandson's <laughs> grandson's grandson will have food, boy. <laughs> That's right. I don't want to plow the field. <laughs> well, what's the food gonna taste like? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I recommend everybody go to this website, check it out if you're interested. We will probably dive into more of it uh, next week. I think all three of us should be reading this. For the next week's show. Yes, sir. Uh, and everybody should pick out parts that they want to go through. It's macroevolution.net. All right. All right, guys. All right. I'll link to it in the yeah. show notes. Awesome. Thank you for bringing that to the table there, buddy. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks to uh, the old T-Bone Shuffle in the Discord. Oh, uh, yeah. He was the one. He was like, you got to get this guy in our show. So. And, and thanks to Nick. Yeah. Because uh, that's what started this whole conversation over yeah. the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Yep. So basically, you're totally wrong, buddy. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. <laughs> this whole show is dedicated to proving how wrong you are. <laughs> Don't feel bad, though. We're all wrong, too. We do it to ourselves all the time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Join the Snake Force, buddy. Thank you so much for being a Patreon supporter and writing that excellent email that was a great compliment sandwich. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Go to the website, brothers of the serpent.com. Check out the encyclopedia, the glossary. Check out the snake skins, which is our merchandise store. Join the pyramid scheme. Send us free money and send us straight to pyramids. Use Patreon or PayPal. Uh, thanks so much to everybody who has done that. We read some of the uh, donation notes. If you use PayPal, you can send us donation notes. If you go, if you join on Patreon, you can also send us notes that way. And I, I almost always read the notes we get from Patreon on the show. Unless, of course, the person tells me not to. 
which does happen. Uh, share the shows wherever you can. Give us reviews on the iTunes store. That really helps. Go to Apple Podcasts and give us reviews there. Thanks to all of you who have. Who have. There are some new reviews that I didn't get to this week, so I'll probably read them next week because I always read the reviews as well. Thank you guys so much. Join the Facebook group. Uh, also join the Discord. That's really where we're where we're congregating these days. I really recommend people join the Discord. There's a link to it on the website. Join up. You'll get you'll get thrown in that little hatchery. Well, we have a we have a uh, you'll be asked some questions, some test questions. To make your make sure you're not a troll, and that you actually listen to the podcast. <laughs> and then if you can answer the questions, they're pretty easy. All you have to have done is listen to a show or two, and you can answer the questions. And then we let you into the whole place, and you become Snake Force. <laughs> but we have to test for trolls because we have gotten a few uh, recently. And Kyle kicked him out. It's really <laughs> awesome. Kyle's like the Kyle's never there, and he and out of all the mods we have, Kyle had to show me like, what the hell is this guy doing here? Bam! <laughs> kicked him out. <laughs> I now have a troll account. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget about the Library of the Serpent, run by Jeff, who also runs the Discord. So thanks very much to him. The library is linked on the website. It has a whole list of books and PDFs and papers and everything, everything basically related to subject, subjects we talk about on the show. So it is extensive and will provide you for rabbit holes to dive into for the rest of your life. Uh, History Shift, who makes all of our YouTube videos, he's also in the Discord, so if you want to talk to him or hang out with him, he's been he's organized the meetup where he's taking people out to see some of the stuff he's looking at. So you can check out his website and his YouTube channel. Uh, so thanks very much to him because he makes all of our YouTube videos. So look him up, History Shift. Also, Pod Doodles, who takes some of our podcasts and turns them into uh, doodles. You can watch him drawing while listening to the show. It's really cool. So check him out on uh, YouTube and on Twitter. And uh, let's see. Thanks to Where Did the Road Go, Uncharted X, Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape, Grimerica, Conspiranormal, uh, Skeptico, and the Seven Ages Audio Journal, and all the other podcasts out there that we listen to that I don't get to mention every time. Thank you guys so much. Yep. And all of you listeners, we love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Tom. <laughs> Sanga Cattle, by the way. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Snakes. Great question. Snakes. Thanks.